Hello and welcome to another episode of Throttle Stop Garage. In today's episode, we're going to have part two of our redo on the front suspension. Stay tuned. All right, so if you joined us on the first episode, I reviewed how I was going to set up to get the suspension uh, back into my 1966 Volvo. Uh, so I'm putting a Corvette C4 suspension into this car. I've already built most of the car out of carbon fiber. Uh, have a look at the work that's been done. Um, anyway, at this point, this is my third attempt at getting the suspension put into this car. Now, I've also, I've made all the mistakes. I'm not a professional. I'm just here in my garage trying to share how exactly this has gone down for me. But what I know is I'm going to need a frame jig. And the last time I did this, my frame jig, which I built out of just two inch square tubing, was nowhere near square enough or flat enough in order to make this work. And my jig game was pretty rudimentary at best because I thought, ah, I'm gonna do this once. I'm not planning on doing this more than one time. That was a fatal mistake. So I promised myself last time that if I ever did it again, not that I knew I'd be doing it again, that I would actually make the investment and try to build the best frame jig that I can. That's going to be what we're going to do today. All right, so the fundamentals for the frame jig are going to be aluminum extrusions. It's not as crazy as it sounds. It's a little crazy, but remember, I said I was going to try to build this the best that I could because last time it was driving me a little bit crazy. Now, it's probably, it's just me. I, I know that. Don't, don't, don't say that in the comments. I understand it's me. Uh, that's just the way I am. If something's a sixteenth of an inch out, you know, if it's a two mil out, I'm freaking out. And there's no need, but, and I know that, but I understand it, but I can't control it. Uh, anyway, so aluminum extrusions is the way that I'm going with this. So these are 45 by 90 mil aluminum extrusions. And I bought all the brackets and the nuts and the everything to put these things together to make the jig. Why? Because it's straight, right? And to be honest, by the time I bought it, I did source it uh, from Alibaba out of China. And I did ship it all the way here to Canada, which wasn't all that bad. Um, what I can tell you is, at the end of all of this, I can just unbolt it and I can put it up in my rafters and it's gonna be gone uh, for good. Uh, and then I can take it out and rebuild it anytime I like and it's pretty straightforward. So I've built with this kind of system before and it's very straightforward. It's easy to keep it square. You can cut this stuff with a chop saw in your garage. I'm not even gonna put my aluminum blade on just to show you that you can. And at the end of the day, with a little bit of help from our friends at Send Cut Send, we're going to just uh, make the brackets and pieces that we need in order to get this frame jig finalized. And then we're gonna put the cross member on the frame. We're gonna pull the geometry from the cross member. Then we're gonna shrink it to where we need to get it. Then we're gonna optimize it. And then we're gonna go ahead, build it and put it in. But those will be the next probably two episodes after this one. In this episode, let's get going and build the frame jig and get the brackets made. So back when I was figuring out that I had a problem, I mounted the suspension onto a random piece of that 4590 that I just happened to have in the shop at the time. And it's been sitting in the background of videos for, uh, let's call it two years. <laughs> so sitting there waiting for me to actually get at it while I did all kinds of other things on the car. Truthfully, what's going on there most of the time for me is I'm figuring out what's going on. I need to figure out what went wrong and get it really straight in my head. Now, the first thing up after I get everything unbolted from the welding table, and if, again, if you don't have one of these welding tables, they're absolutely marvelous. I did make a video on how to build your own if you're interested, uh, and this happens to be a pro one, but it's not a Certiflat flat because they wouldn't sell to me at the time, although they're now selling into Canada, which is interesting. Uh, maybe I was causal. Uh, I never did put feet on the bottom of it, and it's, uh, my welding table isn't level, and nothing in my garage could be level. Uh, but my welding table sure can be as soon as I go ahead and tack just some bolts onto the bottom of the whole table. So we're just going to grab the MIG squirt gun here, give it a zap, get those in place, and then grab the levels and get everything leveled up. Now, once it's leveled up, I have to lock my table down into position as to where it's going to go so that it doesn't move. So I've grabbed uh, both of my digital levels and just adjusting the nuts on the bottom 
really doesn't take all that long to do. Just a few minutes in and we're going to get this tablet table uh, nicely leveled up and that's going to make a huge difference in this because you do need a level plane to start from. If you're not going to start, you start a tenth of a degree out, everything is going to drive you crazy. So start it at zeros, make it make the noise, and away you go. So I bought this material quite a long time ago actually. I had it shipped from China. I found a supplier on Alibaba that would supply me two meter long lengths. That seemed to be sort of the sweet spot for shipping this stuff. And it's been sitting in my garage for, ah, let's call it a year. Anyway, you can cut it with your chop saw, just go. I mean, again, I'm on the video lapse here, so it looks like I'm going like Jack the Bear, but I'm not really. Uh, I'm moving it through slowly. Those are the three pieces that are gonna be the middle parts of this frame. Once I'm done cutting them, I put them all together, square them up on the far end, one last chop, and we're done. All right, I think you can see where we're going with all of this now. So I'm just mocking this up on the bench because once I start to build it, it's going to actually be far too big uh, to kind of fit anywhere in here. It's extremely cramped as always. But this is going to be the new frame jig. So at this point, there's going to be a base part here that is going to bolt to my welding table via these other brackets that I made previously. And then the there's going to be a cross piece. It's going to bolt to this. Again, the last time I did all this, getting a square frame of reference was like half of the struggle and part of the problem. So we will have it nice and square with all the bits and pieces with this aluminum extrusion system. Uh, these are the sort of popsicles that I made up to handle wheel hubs. So there's five on four and a half right there, or five on 4.75 actually, that's the Corvette C4 bolt pattern, uh, with the right bolt spacing so that this goes on to this uh, and then can be adjusted. I think you can kind of see how that's going to work. That's going to bolt to there. And then we get another little angle bracket onto this. Uh, and before everyone starts yelling at me in the comments about this stuff, uh, the material itself is, is not particularly expensive. It's the brackets uh, every time. It's the brackets that kill you. But I did find that um, when I was buying this stuff out of China, brackets actually pretty cheap there too. These were only a few dollars a piece. So I bought lots in the anticipation that I'm going to need uh, lots in order to complete the project. Let's get going on getting that part figured out. Um, and then we will, we'll peel the plastic covering off it. Ooh, very fancy. Okay, let's get rolling. So as I continue to mock this up on the bench, then this is what's going to happen, right? We're going to imagine that this long, uh, the long leg here is going to be the jig eventually. And this will be the cross piece. And I'd like that cross piece to slide forward and backwards and be able to move it around there pretty easily. And, and one of the uh, easiest ways to do that would be to take something and just sort of make a little turtle T square out of it and just bolt it up to the back, have it register in onto the side of the material here, uh, do the same on the other side, bolt it up. And then when it slides back and forth, it won't rack. I'll be able to keep it relatively square or at least put a square on it. Remembering again, one of the things I was fighting the last time was things, it was very difficult to tell what was square. I wasted a ton of time doing that and trying to get things that are square and not twisted was a real challenge. So let's hope this little idea works.
How cold is it in the shop? It's get the torch out to dry up the dicum cold. That's how cold it is in the shop. Okay, so as we get rolling along, we're now going to have to deal with how to make the upper control arm mount. I would like to be able to pull the geometry off of all of these points. And unlike simple suspensions like a Mustang 2 or something, it's not easy because all the coordinates here are kind of complicated and a little difficult to get at. Uh, again, there's a bushing holder here, easy enough to do. You can kind of think you can locate the center of that, but it is going to be a challenge. And the ball joint mount, of course, isn't square to anything. It's sitting here at an angle on this thing. And I am going to use, and I want to use, the forged aluminum parts from the Corvette C4. That's one of the better parts of the whole thing, right? I mean, these are these are cool. Uh, <laughs> if nothing else, uh, they keep... I mean, again, it's not going to matter, but they, they are just that extra little bit lighter. They are strong, uh, and they're going to be fine. But the problem is... Just like a lot of GM products at the time, uh, they were mounted on what is commonly referred to as a dog bone. So this is the dog bone. It does put the outer bushing forces into single shear. So on the off chance that you got, you know, a little fender bender or something, then you'll find that these bend, right? Because there's nothing holding it on the outside, which would be in double shear, right? So there's nothing holding it out here it's bolted here and there. So by the time you try to make some sort of a jig to pull that coordinate, huh, you're gonna have to, what, chop the dog bone off or something in order to get it to work. So I'm gonna have to do something with it. And one of the problems that I found, it was hard, I didn't even notice it uh, before, uh, was again, the passenger side for the Corvette C4. So that's the that side that people are going to be bashing into a curb. For example, it seems to be the one that you can't find. Uh, there's the one that I have. I think, well, I've got two now because this one's so bent. Like, you can kind of see it. It's a little bit hard to tell. Well, not really. And easy to tell there. You can see how much that's canted up. Now, when it was bolted onto the A-arm, right, like when this was all installed in one part, I could not tell that that was bent until I tried to rotate it. And these things in their stock uh, configuration with the bonded um, rubber bushings don't, don't rotate. There's extra spring load applied just from that. So <laughs> I wasn't able to rotate this easy and discover that it was as bent as it is. So that's not going to work. So I'm going to fabricate now a jig so that I can pull all of these parts, right? So I'm going to need to have a bushing in that that's the same size as the interior of the bushing so I can bolt the A-arm onto the jig right via that bushing and then when I'm done the center of that bushing I'm going to use it because it's going to be the center of the new parts that I've designed this all sounds a little crazy but trust me this is going to work so that's the essence of the dog bone the dog bone part was not easy to do this uh this took a lot of thinking because I need to not only be able to install the existing control arm onto the setup with the bushing, but then I need to be able to take uh, everything apart once I get the welded jig in place. And I want to be able to reuse the center of the bushing to recenter the new bushing. All right, so that's a lot of bushings that have to get in place here. So out comes the height gauge. I haven't dug this thing out of the corner in quite a long time, but if I'm setting up uh, to lay out holes then always start from one side and just lay your holes out uh, so all the air kind of goes in one direction. Uh, simply leveling it up on the drill press it's never easy to drill a hole straight in the middle of a tube if you're on a drill press but hey that's all I have so you have to figure out how to work with the tools you have not the tools you wish you had. So pump a couple of holes into the thing uh, at the same distance of course that they'll bolt onto the cross member. Uh, just increase the size of the drill as you go. And I finished it off with a step drill. 
and then it's on to making the rest of the parts. This uh, several hours worth of work. <laughs> get the uh, get the old uh, tube notcher out, hammer it through, sand it up, and then get ready to get it all welded together and make that jig properly. So after a bunch of grinding, I thought I would just show you what I'm doing here. So to this tube, I have to do the two offsets for the different sizes of bushing. So again, I cut the saddle and then what I'm looking for here is this one to be 20 mil of standoff from the center line and the other one to be 30 uh, millimeters standoff from the center line. So we're just going to take the tube, you know, if you're wondering how the heck do you measure this stuff? I didn't get it perfect. It's about five thou off, like I'm five thou small. Yeah, I think that's gonna work. So that's pretty close. The larger one, of course, is a little bit easier to handle. And again, it would matter where I even put this stuff on the tube for heaven's sake. Uh, but I got that one dead. Okay, so the tube's uh, 25 and a bit, so. Anyway, what we're looking for there is uh, 42 and a half ish. Yeah, it depends on where I measure it, but I'm in the ballpark every single time. I mean, I can push the caliper three or four thou. Uh, and three or four thou on this isn't gonna matter. In fact, a little small is much better than a little big. <laughs> okay, so now what we're getting to do, the only thing that matters is it's gonna sit in the proper orientation just like the original one did. So let's at least kind of get that there. So I'd like to get that centered and this one centered. Again, the round bushings, which are meant to mount on this arm, simply won't work, right? So there's a round cup in those. There's no way to make this mess work. All right, so with that close enough for me, <laughs> I'm happy here. Now all I have to do, you can see that I've taken uh, the 12 mil nuts. I've had to uh, dimple them just a little bit because I wanted the, the fit to be just a slight little bit tighter. I'm going to just insert the nuts into the end of the tube. I've brushed all of the plating off the nut on the outside so that I'm not welding that junk. Anyway, I'm going to put those in. I'm going to then cut the other stubs. And then this is all that you have to do in order to build a jig uh, to make this suspension. All because this arm originally is in single shear and it's really hard to pick up where the pickup point would be for the eventual jig. Okay, so that's a lot of work, but on we go. Top tip, if you're looking for a way to make sure your holes are squared up, just get a flat bar, put it across the sides of the tube and then stick your little level on it and level it out. So once that's leveled up, how else is it gonna be kept square? Uh, just a couple of tacks in here and then everything else here again uh, is just for practice. I weld uh, very infrequently so being able to get an opportunity to try to work my way around a piece of tube is a, it's a good challenge, something to get some practice in. I know these could probably have survived a simple tack or I could have used the MIG but I like getting the TIG out and just making sure uh, I'm keeping my skills up. Uh, try to keep it cool as you go, don't need this thing turning into some kind of a noodle on me that would be a little bit too much depression for me to deal with at this point so just going to weld it up make it look nice i tend to work these in quarters i don't know how everybody else does it it's uh you know kind of a roll your own sort of thing right whatever works for you uh, but for me i've been welding it like that for like a long time and it seems to work now I'll grab the other bits and pieces and start getting the rest of this thing banged in nuts go for the end Oh yeah, and I'm gonna like hopelessly try to square this up. Like I don't have a lathe or anything. So what am I gonna do? What are you gonna do if you don't have this equipment either? So I get my dial indicator out and I just turn it around and I'm just leaning on that nut, tapping it around with a hammer until I get it to, you know, 10, 20 thou out. Like how straight is that, that bolt bound to be? I don't know, not very. <laughs> Probably pretty straight actually, I shouldn't say that. But this is gonna be good enough. You get it to within, a 15, 20 thou, tack it up, you're fine. That's as straight as you're gonna get it on a, a setup like this. Good enough. Mm, 
It's a little bit hard to capture, but I guess you get the idea. If I go down right next to it here, you can see that we've pretty much finished up about as well as we could. Again, this uh, this short side here, uh, I ground it twice, it's still too short. <laughs> so, uh, one simple washer uh, brought that exactly up to the right height. And then uh, this side here was fine. You saw the bushing fitting on before. So that's gonna go in and sandwich in like so. And then allow me to take the arms off. Once I have them in position, I've already tried it on the frame. It works just nice on the subframe. And I think you'll agree that's turned out, you know, that's pretty good. Given I, I do this never, <laughs> I'm always happy with it. You know, take every opportunity I can to keep working on skills. Okay, so that's that. Um, that's a lot of work just because something's in single shear. The other four bushings that you, you saw me cut, let's get them here. So these other four bushings that you saw me cut, uh, those are for the lower control arm and they needed to be, uh, if you can believe it, about, they needed to be about so 15, 20 thou uh, shorter than these bushings. And again, I, I don't have a lathe or anything. So this is what you're forced to do if you've got, uh, if you've got a grinder and a few tools and not enough sense as you, you can end up doing that. But I haven't even checked these yet. But I'm going to be willing to guess those are, like I normally can grind these things to within just saw me do that, didn't you? <laughs> okay. Like, that doesn't matter. It's a bushing. It's ground to within. Who cares? Um, even on my grinder, if I'm if I'm careful with it and I'm very careful with the calipers, I can probably get these things within two or three thousandths of an inch, which is just fine uh, for most work. Okay, so enough of that. That's the basics now finished for the jig. I mean, this is a crap ton of work to get this jig to work, but now you know why. The engineering for this stuff or the reverse engineering of this stuff is neither easy nor cheap all right let's keep moving on all right so before we can get the cross member bolted down to anything i have to be able to get some kind of bracketing arrangement put onto it so this is what i've come up with for a solution let's go down to this side first uh so i just made these plates uh these in here i don't even know if i videoed making those Anyway, they're, they're plates that have gone in onto the original spring mount. Of course, this had a monoleaf uh, fiberglass spring uh, in the car. So I know that the center of the lower control arm is going to be right here, right? Because it comes out, it's the middle of that bracket is the middle of the spring. So that's also the middle of the lower control arm. I then just made uh, these plates with the same pattern as... The aluminum extrusion i'll then just uh tack them in there because there is a little bias to the way that that um that slot works then the same 4590 material that i'm using throughout this frame member will get bolted onto that and then i'll get a little bit of adjustability out of it as much as i think i need which is not a whole lot then that goes on to another bracket which goes on to the crossbar that fits onto the frame jig. Now, <clears throat> to get the heights right, over here, all I need to know basically is this, this particular bar, this bar that's in here right now is running between the two lower control arm mounts. It's level, because the lower control arms sit level on this cross member. And I just need to know the difference between the middle of the bar and the bottom of this. So I've clamped uh, a more solid piece of aluminum to this so that I can take the calipers and I can get an accurate measurement of the bar, or accurate as you can make with a pair of calipers for heaven's sake. Um, so I can get that measurement and then just take half of the bar height, which is 12 millimeters. That'll be close enough uh, to get this into the ballpark. Actually, it'll be uh, good enough to get it pretty much bang on. Um, and if you're not horrified by production car stuff, every time I go through and worry about every detail on these things, I go and look at an actual stock made part and uh, they're agricultural kind of crude at best. 
and you know what they get the job done um somehow this car was on the road forever like yeah there's welds full of contamination who cares it actually works um so uh not that i'm going to give myself a hall pass on keeping the quality up um but there's also cracks they're kind of hard to see here but um later on i'll show you where the cracks are and i'm not too sure why they're there but anyway that's the cross member that's how i'm pulling all the details out of it next time we see this garbage it should be sitting up on the frame jig there but i can set the welding table to dead flat so there we are we're zeroed out in both directions which is nice now so i wasn't able to do this on the other bench because it was uh it's not square this one is so anyway You can see it's about as good as we're going to get with this stuff. It's sort of twittering around half a degree thereabouts. It'll bump between making the noise and not making the noise, but uh, I quite frankly don't care. If we have a look right down at it, they're flat. They're close enough. A uh, tenth of a degree is not going to matter. That's all these things can measure anyways. Okay, so that's good enough for this that's set up next uh let's get this jig built i'm kind of sick of looking at it so with everything cleaned off and ready to go then i'm just going to start in by adding the corners in there's lots of different ways to make a corner with this material but i chose the flat corner uh, sort of bridging plate if you like because it's going to work out best. I need the top side of this jig to be completely clear. Um, it's got three legs so I designed to put a sort of you know one, a bar in the middle for, for no actual reason. It's not like it's going to go anywhere. I am bolting this down completely to the welding table so once I got this all done, right, so I'm just checking the square there. Uh, you couldn't see the smile on my face. It went by too fast. It's under a millimeter. It was just dead. It was dead perfect. And I adjusted it until it was absolutely in every way perfect. Um, super simple to do. You can't do this with tubular constructions. Like, as soon as you start tacking tube, it's going to it's gonna warp. So as much as this stuff isn't perfect, like you have to be really careful with the brackets, and you have to have a method of squaring stuff. Because you can't just assume the bracket's going to make it square. That's not a good assumption. Um, and then I added an extra set of brackets that I had into the bottom of it. I don't know. Again, no need. Just uh, belt and suspenders. That's sort of the way I roll. Uh, so I'm adding the tapes. So I got some adhesive steel tapes that I'm applying to the middle uh, part of this uh, of this material. Uh, I didn't know how to do it at first. So you're going to watch me mess it up here and uh, try my hardest to... <laughs> to get this all fixed up. Anyway, I want it right dead in the center. The two tapes are made by the same manufacturer. I couldn't get the same tapes for everything. It was a, an absolute Amazon nightmare. Um, anyway, the yellow tapes are gonna be down the length. It's about 1.9 meters long, which is uh, good enough for any of the work I intend to do now and into the future. And the two tapes are then trimmed and they're exactly the same length. So I don't have to take a tape measure from side to side. I know where it is. Now the first cross member part, so this is where the this is the cross bar where the cross member is going to sit. I've got a right hand and a left hand reading tape and I start them in the dead center of that bar. So I always know I've got symmetry from side to side and that's going to get taped down. Now those brackets that I made just to hold the frame like to, to have it stop racking as it's moving back and forth. Uh, they go in with just some T-nuts. I've got all kinds of different T-nut type nuts because there's lots of different ways to, to do that. So that fits in really well. And then as I start to I just adjust it a little bit for feel. So that's got it right exactly where I want it. And now I can slide that back and forth anywhere along it. And I can put that cross member right where I need it. So this is starting to work out. Like if you're going to only do it one more time, I hope, I hope. Like, I should stop saying that because I know the garage gods are going to curse me and I'll screw something up here, but I'm trying desperately not to. Um, all right, last few little bits to go on. There's the little lollipops that I had made. Uh, thanks to Send Cut Send for knocking those out for me. Those are going to hold the hubs. So the hubs on these Corvettes are actually a completely removable uh, assembly. So there's, there's no tapered roller bearings. These are deep groove ball bearings. So they can go bolt into that. 
I can put them exactly at where the suspension is supposed to be and then add in the other brackets that I have. And then I should be able to, theoretically anyways, just toss the suspension. Like I should be able to grab the cross member, chuck it on this whole assembly and see if it works. And you know what? This is the first shot, folks. I didn't even trim this video. I tried to keep it honest, but the bolts, they dropped straight in the hole. Gotta love it. All right, well, no joke. It went right on. I couldn't believe it. I dropped it in and the bolts over here to bolt it down where the old spring purchase went. It just dropped straight into the position that I set off the rail. Yeah, and I had marked and applied that tape to the um, this cross rail and it went and dropped straight in. I've now taken the upright on the one side because I got excited <laughs> and I went and bolted everything on. Now, one of the problems that I have is I not, I don't know where this lower control arm pivot is supposed to be. What I do know is that the lower control arm top surface is supposed to be level. So I've now set it level and I got that measurement off of a friend's car. And it turns out that car has been lowered quite a bit because this popsicle is set to my wheel center, right? So that's my tire radius. That's the center line. And you can see that that's not the center line here. In fact, we've got to move that. Uh, it's a couple of inches, right? So a few, we got about, I think it's about 45 millimeters it has to go up. So a little less than two inches. And we'll get all this stuff sorted out. I think for this episode, we're probably, uh, that's as far as I'm going to get. So let's, uh, let's wrap it up. All right, so here we are. The frame jig is now set. I can move it uh, back and forth, up and down. Again, uh, we didn't get this platform set quite right because I wasn't too sure about the measurements. Now I can actually know what measurement I need. So I'm going to adjust the brackets that hold the cross member, raise it up to where it needs to be. And then we can start pulling the geometry off of the existing uh, suspension. So off of this existing cross member and then fit it into the reduced width cross member that I'm going to need for my car. Anyway, uh, thanks a lot for joining us on this particular episode. Uh, in the next episode, we'll have a look at how we get that done. And in the meantime, keep your stick on the ice.